24th year for this breakfast meeting, and one constant has been the presence of our next gentleman. Here to bring the occasion is the Director of the Office of Civil Rights and Wage Enforcement, our friend, Mr. Alvin Ogilar. Good morning. Thanks, Gigi. Before we start, we do want to acknowledge and thank all of you for being here this morning, and particularly Dr. Joanne Martin from the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum, who so graciously always provides the wax figures for us this morning. So thank you, Dr. Martin. The Baltimore Office of Civil Rights and Wage Enforcement has evolved significantly since its inception in 1956 as the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This evolution, which encompasses greater responsibility and a broader mandate, has been challenging, even daunting, but always reflective of what is needed at the time and what has simply been the right thing to do. The Office of Civil Rights and Wage Enforcement enforcement responsibilities have been extended over the years to now cover not only employment, but public accommodations, education, health and welfare agencies, and housing. In addition to enforcing the city's wage laws and accepting and investigating complaints alleging law enforcement's use of excessive force, abusive language, harassment, false arrest, and false imprisonment. The three programs housed within the office are the Community Relations Commission, the Wage Commission, and the Civilian Review Board. Ladies and gentlemen, the occasion this morning is this. Civil rights laws, once enacted, are meaningful only if they are duly enforced and the effectiveness of the enforcement is dictated by the resources, commitment, and independence of those agencies responsible for investigating complaints and providing redress. The occasion this morning is that history has taught us that left to its own devices, we as a community will not live up to the ideals of equity, opportunity, and inclusion but there must be intentionality in protecting the rights of all people. That intentionality must manifest itself in many forms, including legislation, funding, coalitions, advocacy, agitation, service, and selflessness. The occasion this morning to paraphrase what Rabbi Julie Spitzer offered at the first breakfast meeting in 1989 is the words we hear this morning will surely resonate within us for some time. But if that is all they do, then we have not truly listened, for embedded in the words will be a call to action. Ours now is to give life to the words, to create, to guide, to nurture, to respond, to lead. The occasion this morning is that discrimination based on race, sex, national origin, religion, and color continue to plague us as a community and as a nation. In addition, injustices based on sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, and disability continue to persist. There continues to be growing civil rights violations in the areas of education, health care, human trafficking, and voluntary servitude, color of law abuses, and believe it or not, even in public accommodations. The occasion this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have absolutely come a long way, but the job is not done. And if we are not careful, our energies will not be spent fighting new fights, but it will be spent fighting fights that we thought we had already won. That's the occasion this morning. 
and we thank you for your presence and we thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Villar, for all that you do and the Office of Civil Rights do in our city every day. And speaking of the city, now it is a pleasure to present to some of you and introduce the others to others of someone that we are all tremendously proud of. Here to offer greetings is the Honorable Mayor of Baltimore City, Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Good morning, everyone. I know it's Purple Friday, and, and just for those of you in the back, I have it up here. I'm wearing it on my eyes. I, last time, last I haven't gotten together from, from last year yet, but I'm committed. You won't catch me without purple for another Friday. I, I, I will do better, but I, I did represent. I know, I know some people are concerned. Can we give another hand to Gigi Barnett? She is doing a fantastic job. Thank you for lending your time and your talent to be with us today. I know you have a very busy schedule, so I appreciate uh, you being here. I want to uh, thank a few people. I see uh, Delegate uh, Shirley Nathan Pulliam. Thank you for being here today with you. And the support that you continue to give uh, to my administration, and uh, speaking of which, I do have a few cabinet members here. I'm going to do my best to scan the crowd. If I miss anybody, please forgive me. I know I have a lot of members of my uh, team that are here today. I see uh, Director Al Fox, who is here, Director DPW. I, and his team, the DPW team, represented, I see
point of personal privilege that she is sharing herself with us here in Baltimore today. And, and for you, Dr. Malvo, and all of your Delta sisters, I'll say happy 100th yeah. anniversary of this year that I know y'all aren't finished celebrating yet.
It's also important to note that the Office of Civil Rights serves as a committee member and a co-chair for the Baltimore uh, Police Department's Advisory Committee on LGBT issues, which are very vital at this time in our country's history. Most of you are aware that I have set a goal to grow Baltimore by 10,000 families over the next decade. It is a goal that city government cannot do alone. Strong partnerships like these between citizens, law enforcement, and, and city government are key, not only to advancing equality and protecting civil rights, but also key to vital benchmarks in reducing crime, increasing economic opportunity, and improving the quality of life in our city. Earlier this month, I joined with Raise Maryland to, to rally for an increase in Maryland's minimum wage. The minimum wage is one of the most pressing civil rights issues we are currently facing. In the last few years, our national economy has rebounded, and then for some, for some, they're still waiting for the rebound to happen. The distance between the haves and the have-nots growing out of this great recession continues to widen, where families are earning, on average, less than they did in 1989, uh, which means that even Though we might be creating jobs and uh, you know some people's wages are going through the roof, there are a lot of families that are still hurting. And there are a lot of families who depend on minimum wage jobs that have to make the tough choices that none of us, uh, none of us hope to ever have to uh, choose to make. Uh, one woman at the press conference uh, mentioned that you know there are days where she has to decide who's going to eat. You know, which one, of you, who, which one of her family members is going to eat? Talking to some people that they, about the minimum wage, the woman said that her husband and her take turns. You know, when, when it gets, you know, right before payday and, you know, I'm not the only one that knows what that feels like. Uh, you know, when you're trying to stretch it, uh, they choose who's going to eat, the husband or the wife. So the, this is a crucial issue that requires all of us to to lean into this discussion and, and, and lend our voices to the efforts to raise the minimum wage. As a nation, we've come a long way from where we were in the months and years following the collapse of the housing market, though it might be hard to tell because, as I mentioned, the economic situation for far too many is improving too slowly. And Maryland is the wealthiest state in the country, but we are leaving our low-wage workers behind. If minimum wage had kept up with inflation, it would be $10.74 today. And instead, it's only $7.25, an amount that no family can live on. And in order to afford a fair market rate for a two-bedroom apartment, a minimum wage earner would need to work 135 hours per week, 52 weeks a year. A household would need to include 3.4 minimum wage earners working 40 hours a week. Women and people of color make up a majority of the minimum wage workers. Raising the minimum wage is not just an economic concern, it is a civil rights demand. There are some who say that raising the minimum wage is not necessary. These, detract these detractors are out of touch. The they do not understand what poverty truly is. For most families living in poverty, poverty means waking up each morning, commuting to a minimum wage job or two, working hard and still struggling to make ends meet. But the, campaigns, the, the campaign to raise the minimum wage to $10.10 .10 is gaining momentum. Raising the minimum wage to $10.10 .10 will give around 472,000 Marylanders, many of whom are living in poverty, a much needed bump in pay. And I want to add this too, and I know I'm probably going to get to that. Are you trying to kick me off yet, Gigi? All right, just checking. But this is another point that I want to make. When, and don't get me wrong, I'm a capitalist and I believe in making, you know, making as much money as you can within the law. I'm all for that. I'm not regretting anybody, their measure of success. That being said, when we think about how we're going to generate um, success and economic um, prosperity in our cities, when, you, when the money is going to the top earners, is going, again, I'm not paying, I'm just talking, beach houses and luxury this and out of our jurisdiction to, to, you know, offshore accounts and everything else. 
when the money is gone, we, when we increase wages for our lowest paid workers, that money is circulating in our community. So it's not just about making sure that our, our lowest paid workers are being paid more. It is infusing more dollars in our own community. You know, that's, you know, to me, even more reason that more of us need to lean into this conversation. 19 states in D.C. have a thank you. 19 states and D.C. have a higher minimum wage in the state of Maryland, even though our state is one of the, has one of the highest costs of living. It's time for Maryland to catch up. In the last year, our nation has seen the civil rights, has seen civil rights victories and civil rights setbacks. You know, and, and when I talk about you know, minimum wage being the, the, the next civil rights issue, we're not done with the last one, which is voting rights. The, uh, the Supreme Court's decision affecting our voting rights, I believe, is devastating, and we haven't seen the last of the impacts. I believe that our nation and our city are moving forward, but there's a lot more work to do. We must continue to fight for the right and fight for rights and spring to aid of our brothers and sisters who are subjected to unlawful discrimination and equality. So I look forward to the rest of today's meeting and another year of working together advancing equity, opportunity, and inclusion. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you, Madam And we had mentioned earlier also in our breakfast that of course last month we celebrated the March in Washington where Dr. King delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech. We talked about having a dream and as Madam Mayor just mentioned, his dream is not yet realized. We're working on it but it's not yet fully here, so thank you, Madam Mayor. Now it is time for the featured event of the morning. Please welcome the chairperson of the Board of Commissioners for the Community Relations Commission, Dr. Michelle harris Fondima, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so excited to be here this morning. It is so encouraging to see all of you here again this year. I have to take a deep breath because I have been looking forward to this morning for quite some time. With all the challenges that we have before us in today's world, and with all the talking heads, opinion shapers, self-appointed leaders, it is great to have an opportunity to hear from someone who has credibility. Okay. Our keynote this morning is a respected labor economist, noted author, educator and commentator. As of the 15th, as the 15th president of Bennett College, America's oldest historically black college. Any Bennett people here today? No? Okay. <laughs> Dr. Julianne Melville was the architect of an exciting and innovative transformation of that institution. We actually watched that uh, institution grow. The recipient of a PhD in economics from P of MIT, Dr. Melmo is shaping public opinion in the 21st century America through her contributions to the public dialogue on issues of race, culture, gender, and their economical impacts. An accomplished uh, columnist and author, Dr. Melmo's writing has appeared in the USA Today, Black Issues in Higher Education, Ms. Magazine, Essence Magazine, and The Progressive. She has authored The Paradox of Loyalty, an African-American response to the war on terror, and co-authored Unfinished Business, a Democrat and Republican take on the 10 most important issues women face. Dr. Melvo has served on the faculty or visiting faculty of San Francisco State University, the University of California, Berkeley, the College of Notre Dame, Michigan State University, and Howard University. Please join me and let's give her a round of applause in welcoming the progressive, insightful pioneer whose favorite quote is, don't believe the hype. The one and only Dr. Jeanette, uh, Julian Mobo. Well, good morning, everyone. Come 
Somehow y'all have a little more energy than that. You've been fed. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's my pleasure and delight to be here. I want to thank you for the invitation. I certainly want to thank our brother um, administrator for his company as we sat together and chatted. And I must tell you, uh, your sister mayor is phenomenal. I did not feel, yes. I did not realize until yesterday that she was the only African-American woman to lead a major city. And as she made her acknowledgments, which I will not attempt to duplicate, what I would say is what I got from you, Stephanie, I should say Mayor Stephanie, is that teamwork makes the dream work. Again, say that with me, teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. She had a dream for Baltimore, and she's beginning to implement it. 10,000 new families to your city will give you the vital boost that you need. I quite frankly think that you ought to up that goal to talk about 20 or even 30,000 families. Right. It's certainly within the realm of possibility to draw people who have money, not to say y'all don't have money, but draw people who have more money to your city and to allow their presence to improve the quality of life for everyone. Now your theme this morning is civil rights, a reflection on the past, discussion of the present, and contemplation of the future. I'm just going to take that and edit it to call have we moved forward or have we moved backward? This is the question of the hour. Just about a month ago, thousands of people thronged to Washington, D.C to celebrate or to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Several days later, last week actually, we mourned the massacre of the four little girls in Birmingham. We have so many anniversaries this year and next that we will be commemorating basically until the end of the year. But will we commemorate progress or regress. You would have to be Ray Charles to say that we had not made any progress, but you would also have to be Ray Charles to see that there has not been any regress. Here's what Dr. King said when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. He said, I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, peace and freedom for their spirits. We are not there yet. Your sister mayor has talked about the low wage, and this is a major issue in our society. She has talked about the ways we walk over the people who make our lives easier. The Starbucks barista, what if he or she wasn't there? Then you wouldn't have that coffee. The person who delivers your mail, not your mail, but your newspaper, what if they weren't there? You'd be walking down the block. Our servers, and let's just give them a hand. Our servers. If they weren't there, y'all would be eating buffet. And you know how that does not turn out right. You know, some sisters take all the meat. Uh, yeah, that be, let me not go there. But I will tell you that one of the most embarrassing moments of my life was to invite a bunch of my sister friends to an event and to find some of them putting their hors d'oeuvres in their pocketbooks. And a friend said to me, are those your people? I said, no, I don't know them. I truly do not know them. But you know, if you have that kind of situation, you have that kind of situation. But in any case, we know that those who serve us, that those who work with us, that those who make our lives easier deserve the same recognition we do. Dr. King was on a plane one time, and he talked about how the plane was delayed. Of course, this was when flying was really flying. So now it's like getting on the Greyhound bus. 
you know? Um, back in the day, you couldn't get on the plane with jeans and a t-shirt. You kind of dressed up. But now you just get on there with whatever and behave like whatever. But in any case, he told a story about being on an airplane and the plane was delayed. And so, of course, the flight attendants, they called them stewardesses then, came around and brought people little peanuts and little drinks and this and that. And they kept you up to date, said they're trying to fix something. And then, you know, two or three rounds of goodies. And they said they're still trying to fix something. And finally they fixed it and everybody clapped for the pilot. And Dr. King said, don't forget the ground crew. Because if you look down, the pilot was not fixing the plane. The pilot was sitting there getting ready to fly the plane. But it was a ground crew, the ground crew, who deserved recognition. So we have gotten so high and mighty that all too often we don't look at the ground crew. It's our job to look at the ground crew because we're all in this thing together. Yesterday, I was with Congressman Keith Ellison, who is one of my favorite members of Congress, because he's a progressive. He's looking at our wages. He's looking at the ways that people live. He's looking at the compromises that people have to make. And we sat there around the table and talked about what's going on with lots of people. He led us in a conversation about low wages. But even more than that, Congressman Ellison talked about the fact that you may be riding high on the hog today, and you may be riding low on the ground tomorrow. There was a brother there who made $27 an hour just a year and a half ago. He lost his job due to downsizing. He makes $9 an hour. So that's a cut in two-thirds of what he's making. And what he said is that his life has completely changed. He cannot qualify for a Parent PLUS loan for his daughter who is in college. He cannot help her in the way he'd like to because he doesn't have the dollars. Everybody has a story like that. You know somebody whose life has toppled, who has completely changed. But what are we gonna do about it? People behave as if poverty is a personal problem, not a political problem. People behave as if they're ashamed when they've fallen on good times without looking at all the people who have. I have a dear friend who is an attorney and an MBA who over leveraged herself in the housing expansion and so lost two homes in the housing constriction. I had not been able to catch up with her. I'm from San Francisco. I went home twice, tried to call her. She was incognito, couldn't find her. <laughs> and so I said to my mom, look for her. Well, it turned out that she was living with her mom and was too embarrassed to share that. And I said, do you know how many people lost their homes? This is not personal, it's political. It's policy-based. What I want y'all to understand is that this is policy-based. There is a war not only on the poor, but on those in the periphery. Your organization, the Office of Civil Rights and Wage Enforcement, is basically the line that cannot be crossed if you do your job. Now, I know you do, so I'm not criticizing, but what I'm saying is that everybody here is a member of the choir. I am preaching to the choir. And I want the choir to start singing louder. You must. Well, Dr. King was not killed after he made that conversation at the March on Washington. He was killed when he started connecting poverty to international oppression. He, he was killed when he was anti-Vietnam. We, he was killed when he talked about young black men going to war when they could not find jobs here. He was killed as he started the Poor People's Campaign, when the issue was to bring poor people from all over the country to Washington, D.C. to make demands. At the March on Washington, Dr. King is remembered for saying, I have a dream when people would be judged, 
by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And there are many people who quote him on that, quote him on this. We have come to the nation's capital to cash a check, and that check has been marked insufficient funds. It's, as opposed to, I have a dream, if we said cash the check, we'd be talking about economic change, not just dreaming change. See, you dream, it's like you laid down and you had a dream. Oh yeah, you just had a dream. But it, you know, it's like work, your know, prayer without faith is dead. Dreaming without acting is simply play acting. And so we have to grab that part of the dream that talks about wages, that talks about poor people, that talks about equality, that talks about the issues that we must deal with. Many of us don't want to deal with those issues. You're hanging on by a toenail yourself. You look around, you say, I wish I could help, but I can't. But yes, you can, and yes, you must. And if you don't, you have repudiated the dream. That's what you've done. You called Dr. King's name in vain, in absolute vain, if you decide that you won't fight for his dream. Now, you know, there are people who think that we attain the dream. When President Barack Obama was elected, there are some people who said we can go post-racial. We don't have to worry about race because we got a black president. But you know, Dr. King didn't say he had a dream that one man would be president of the United States. And while we love our brother president, we must acknowledge that he has not tackled a series of economic issues that we'd like him to tackle. The federal government lends contracts to people who don't pay a living wage. The federal government, with its contracting out, allows people to pay whatever they want to, but allow CEOs to make up to $750,000 a year. Give me a break. Now, this is not President Obama. This has been happening for a long time. But by the simple stroke of a pen, by an executive order, President Obama couldn't stop that. Now, I know he's dealing with Syria, $100 billion. And I know he's dealing with a number of other issues deal with poor people. Poor people is like a cuss word in this administration. You know, it is truly like something, if you try to say it, it gets stuck in your throat. We are ignoring the people who need the most help. And while, again, we love Brother President, we have to understand that that's not the dream. That's an advancement, but that's not the dream. On the very same month that President Obama was elected, a man named Oscar Graham was shot at a BART station in San Francisco simply because somebody said there was a disturbance. And then, as handcuffed, he prayed with the others for peace. And a man named Messerhoff decided that he, um, and the police officers here will help me out with this, he thought his taser was a Glock. Is that within the realm of possibility? He thought the taser was a Glock. Where's the officer up in here? I know I heard some. Can a taser be a Glock? No. Nah. And so he shot this brother with a Glock because he thought it was a taser. No, he massacred that young man. And then he served, time served, plus eight months. That's what a black life is worth. And so then you look at Trayvon Martin. Fast forward. How does somebody who was told to keep their hind parts in the car, told to stay in the car, get himself out of the car, sign some nonsense, shoot the brother for Skittles and iced tea, Skittles and iced tea, and walk? This happens time and time and time and time again. We all have a story. I have a nephew, and I shouldn't tell this story. Everybody in my family says when I tell family stories, I have to give them five hours because uh, they, I, they say I'm pimping on their experiences. <laughs> so they want $5. Well, $5 ain't going to cost me much. I mean, I think, you know, I can afford the $5. But my nephew, who lived in Oakland, California, until he left for um, LA, has a, an Oscar Grant story that we pray about every day. 
Anya had a Cadillac that was made out of spit and bubble gum. If you put your foot through the Cadillac, you would step on the seat, the, the pavement. I mean, it was a pitiful car. I wouldn't even ride it. I, I said, how much you pay for the car? He said, 250. I said, okay, you know, 250. Anyway, he parked the car at a bar station, meeting some of his colleagues, came out of the station to go into the train. Police follow him and say, you're driving a stolen car. I'm thinking, who would steal that? <laughs> I mean, come on now, 250. Who would steal that? But the policemen did not get it. Anya was with two of them. They were working for youth radio, and they sent out these multicultural teams. He was with two um, Caucasian friends, with one other African-American friend, and a Latino brother. They were like, nobody would steal Anya's car. Knocked him down on the floor. This seems to be what the people like to do. Knocked him down on the floor, handcuffed him for stealing the car, a car. His friends, well, the little white girl was crying. She was like, no, he didn't do it. She's crying. The young white man was like, my daddy is a lawyer. We gonna get you. <laughs> the brother ran. I mean, he, <laughs> he did not have Ivy's back whatsoever. <laughs> but the white girl kept saying, check the number, check the number, check the number. Maybe you got a digit wrong. They did have a digit wrong. But there was no apology. There was nothing. This young black man, who I criticized for all that hip hop, sagging, dragging, tattooed look, had actually put a white shirt on, which he does about twice a year, and it was thrown down, and so his shirt was uh, basically soiled. But he's bitter. He is bitter. His story, all of his friends know, and it is a bitter story. We want our young people to work with officers of the law. We want them to say the policeman is our friend. But we can't say that all the officers aren't bad, but too many of them are. We don't want to have Oscar Grant, Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Anya Malik Howe stories. We don't need those stories. When we talk about where have we been, we had people sick dogs on young people back in 1963. Now they don't sick dogs, they sick tasers. And so we have to say we want that to stop as well. Sister Mayor, to have a police review commission is to move us forward. To say that everything is all right is to move us backward. We cannot have backward movement. And we have to understand what Dr. King said. We have issues in our community. You know we do. We have challenges with our GBLT community. A lot of us don't want to deal with that. But injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And we have to deal with that as openly as we deal with injustice toward us. We in the African American community must deal with the ways that we treat women. We know, quite frankly, that we still have a hierarchy of patriarchy. And how can African American men ask for equality and at the same time discriminate against African American women. Come on now, y'all. It's over time for us to look at oppression of all kinds. Dr. King would do that. We must do that. Until we do that, we can't talk about equal pay. We can't talk about the wealth gap. We have to talk about ourselves. But it's time for us to have a major grassroots movement. We saw the poverty data on Tuesday. What did it say? It said that 27.6% of the African American community lives in poverty. It says that 26% of Latino community lives in poverty. Meanwhile, 10% of the white community lives in poverty. I don't want anybody to be poor, but I want these gaps to close. I want these gaps to close. We learned that 37% of African American children live in poverty. That is disgraceful, disgraceful. And so these are gonna be children who come up in poverty and are gonna be mad at us. They're not gonna have access to education. They're not gonna have access to healthcare. They're not gonna have access to the things that we think are baseline issues in our quality of life. 
We are responsible for raising wages because we are responsible for the futures of our young people. How dare we close our eyes and shut our ears to the cries of the poor? How dare we think we're going forward when so many people are going back? In 1964, the poverty rate in the African-American community was 55%. Well, we know 1964 there were issues. We're not going to go through all that. Now, in 1978, that poverty rate had stopped at about 15%. Now, we see it back up at 27.6%. What's going on? There is an indifference. This is personal. People have used stereotypes to say, uh-uh, these people are lazy. Yesterday, the Congress, the Congress decided to cut food stamps by $40 billion. That means they will be kicking 4 million families off food stamps. In addition, they have imposed a work requirement that says you can't get food stamps unless you are working. Okay, the unemployment rate is 7.2%. The black unemployment rate is 13%. But you can't get food stamps unless you're working. Okay, then supply us with some jobs. This is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. So many of us are moving forward and many of us are moving backward. What we learn from the census report is that people who earn over $190,000 a year People who earn over $190,000 a year stay even or grew income in the last year. But the rest of us lost income. Now, if there's anyone in here who makes $100,000, $191,000 a year, I suggest you write a check to Sister Mayor so she can use that money to feed people. That is my suggestion. Now, I ain't going to ask you to raise your hand because somebody might mug you on the way outside this place. But the fact is that the rest of us are standing still. And so come on, y'all. You want to talk about contemplating the future. The future is your uprising. Your uprising. I love those Occupy children. I love them dearly, but I wish they had goals. They gave us a whole lot of street heat and then they didn't give us what to do. Well, I'm gonna tell you what to do. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, peace and freedom for their spirit. Do what Dr. King told you to do. Thank you very much.